Blessed strength. Oh, this star here. Let's see. Highly I, Selassie I, the first, Nagus, Nagas, Rastafari. Yes. Um, blessed evening. This is the anniversary of Her Majesty's second international speech to the women of the world. And Empress Menon uh, did this speech today. It was broadcasted in the United States as well as in Great Britain. So in the U.S., they heard it around 4.30 in the evening. And then it played in Great Britain at around 9.30 in the evening. And so um, also there were letters sent and there were a number of correspondences during April. Excuse me. And so this is a very sad moment because of the fact that this is remembering the war, World War II. And this is Ethiopia's conflict with Italy. And this conflict led to millions of Ethiopians killed during 1935-36. And this left a number of Italians killed as well as having to return home after a brutal five-year war, five-year plus. And so it is an honor to be able to have the words of Her Majesty and to hear her voice, to hear um what it would sound like would be great and we will try to get that um as it is available this speech as well as september speech 1935 september 1936 april this being the second speech of her majesty this speech was sponsored by the women's international league of Free, peace and freedom and we need to get that straight for one because this was not just some women's international group no this is the women's international group for peace and freedom this is an official international organization and so they have records of this and this is where I I've also obtained a lot of information um, Her Majesty's second speech is not known because this speech was interrupted now we do hear of the September speech being interrupted and I'm sure some places may not have been able to get that we have to know, 1936, where is the place of a woman in society in 1936? Well, she's just maybe getting to vote. Um, she has no power or control of her property um, more than a man at that time. She's definitely working because the war produced working women and um, they're definitely not hearing women making such speeches as Empress Minute a queen an empress coming to the world during Ethiopia's most dreadful hour and so when I think of that vibration brings it more to a seriousness but to hear the words of the Empress is pleasing 
it's it's consoling it's consoling and especially because to hear her mind um around the conflict and i'll be sharing that speech i will also be going over april's calendar and this is a giving um and it's necessary to give Empress Menon's information, especially because it is not common knowledge, though it should be, um, and that is to whoever is going to take that fault. Um, me being an African American, I don't want to insult any Ethiopian because this is Ethiopia's queen. But one thing we must also remember is that she is the Solomonic queen. And so for us, it is a religious factor. She is coming in through the line of Solomon and Sheba. This is a representation and of the lineage of the Solomonic dynasty. This is important, especially as an African American in the West. This is where we can most readily attach our unknown culture and tradition to a more stable, known African connection. Our ancestral connection and so the Bible helps us to get straight to Haile Selassie Empress Minute this is where it's most important for me as an African American okay because we are not seeking to take anything from anyone through our love for their majesties, as Rastas, as Tawahidists, as I say, Christians, we're seeking to celebrate their life and to show our gratitude through study. Um, I'm not coming from just my own love for the Tawahido. But I'm also coming forward from my knowledge of what I've been studying. And that is really a wide variety of information that connects to their majesties and to the message that their majesties would have me to give. Um, this isn't something I take very seriously. Uh, if you receive a message from your creator, whoever you call your creator, then you make your decision on how you act on it. I'm just making the decision of how I will act on it in the most, uh, really in the best way that I can. And so when I translate, um, this information or transcribe it, uh, I try to look for the most consistent word sound of how I've heard the Empress speak. And this speech actually is in about three different formats. Um, and so when you go to omegaisearch.org and you get a book, the ebook on Empress Men and Queen of Sheba, then you will get that information. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and share the speech and read the speech that was the second international speech of Her Majesty. And this is coming forth from my book, Empress Men and Osfal to the Women of the World. These are the words of Her Imperial Majesty of Ethiopia Empress Menin. And 
this speech I called to the women of the world. Um, it was an international speech directed solely to women uh, as the Empress knew who her heart would be heard and felt by and who she wanted to join together in some unit unity, some kind of united um, love, prayer, meditation, whatever could be given, money, aid. Because Ethiopia was under a lot of financial stress. They were trying to buy weapons for the war, but they were never allowed to. And so Ethiopia was really left at a disadvantage during the war. And she was feeling it and she was making an appeal. Even after having come courageously saying that she will fight, she still humbled and to make sure that her people have a chance of having some kind of generation to live. So this is the introduction by Her Imperial Majesty Empress Menon. It was introduced by Caroline Singer. And she's of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She was a longtime member, I believe a founding member. Now this speech was orated by Princess Sahai. And Princess Sahai is very important for Her Imperial Majesty because it was able to get translated into French uh, by Princess Sahai, and it was also be, being able to be translated into English as she was speaking in her native tongue, Amharic. So, um, as I have here, is it was also translated into German. After seeing the horrors of war, which Italy has brought to Abyssinia, I would be faithless to my people if I did not voice in the face of unimaginable atrocities. Could you see the tortured bodies or hear the heart rendering gasps of dying peasants? You would ask, is this civilization the most lamentable aspects of the cowardly use of gas appear in the agonies of women and children i appeal to you to end these atrocities in the name of humanity in this the most crucial hour of my country history and while we are fighting against the most tremendous odds I once more turn to the press of the world in the hope of finding through which we may state our, ca our case. There is yet time for those who desire justice to put an end to this most unjust of wars, this most immoral aggression against the rights of an independent and inoffensive people. All those who respect the principles which are intended to regulate the relations between nations must hide their heads in shame and indignation at the unfair and unequal treatment from which my country has suffered. For many months before the Italian government began this war, but while its intentions were already clearly known, the transportation of munitions, including poison gas and airplanes to the territories adjoining Ethiopia, was carried out on a large scale without a single practical effort on the part of any power to prevent these flagrant preparations for the violation of international agreements, nor is that all.
thus arming Ethiopia herself was denied by an embargo imposed by the other powers the right to arm herself for her own defense. And even after a criminal act of aggression by Italy, this embargo remained in force. The re result was that our soldiers were obliged to leave for the front where they had to meet a heavily armed enemy only inadequately equipped. The most unjust discrimination against us is aggravated by the fact a large quantity of arms is still detained at Djibouti. Although the power controlling the, air, the railway is bound by treaty to transport such material to Ethiopia. Even after the League of Nations had unanimously denounced Italy as the aggressor, Ethiopia experienced innumerable difficulties in securing the arms and munitions to which she had an indisputable right. And yet notwithstanding the overwhelming superiority of equipment of the Italian armies, the later failed for many months to make any notable advance against our soldiers. The Italian soldiers made up for his inadequate arms with bravery. I'm sorry, the Ethiopian soldiers made up <coughs> made up for his inadequate arms with bravery and skill as a warrior. Even machine guns and tanks were overcome and captured and heavy bombardment did not stop our advance or break our front. It was only when the enemy resorted to the most devilish of all means of attack by dropping poisonous and corrosive gases from the air indiscriminately upon men, women, children, and cattle was... Oh was he able to okay so this is kind of out actually stop right there so let me just pause and just say that the information is giving very much detail to what they're experiencing and what is actually creating the most havoc for them. Um, something that the League of Nations promised that gases and that type of aggression wouldn't be used, and it was. You can find this speech. Um, I've done this speech before last year, and you can find it on my YouTube. Now, I'm just going to skip down because... I'm going to just go her last paragraph and you can definitely go to omegaisearch.org and get the book. And to Great Britain, the defender of freedom and justice for all races and to the whole world to abandon all further delay my country from her ruthless adversary. And so Empress Menon really um, addressed who could help. She addressed why the help was needed. And she really put out the situation. So this wasn't just a, an appeal to women. But it was the first one in September. This one is more to all of us because it is pulling at the moral of that generation. It is pulling at the moral of that generation and asking, can you consciously allow this to go on? And will you? And so we do know the outcome 
and we can't analyze it and we should because spiritually it's a judgment now let me go back or forward and for you know for whatever reason I'm not able to really complete it um, and I'm like I'm saying there's one on YouTube that I did last year of this same speech and so um, I'll be giving out a lot of information tonight so I'm glad uh, to just go ahead and sum this up one of the things that Empress Menon did say in this speech was exactly what His Majesty said that basically today it's us and tomorrow could be you so here she says terror will not soon descend upon the populous cities of Europe the just the justice our cause demands the postponement of action on whatever grounds at this decisive moment has the effect of favoring our enemy so she was also seeing that everybody was supporting and really secretly hating on Ethiopia and so she wanted to confront that as we see now I don't think we've ever heard anybody speak so openly um, about who could help and <laughs> who is at blame usually when we hear a lot of the politics we don't they don't get to the point and say hey you did this now clean this up and as a mother she she put it on the table and her her nature is to have peace and for so many reasons she was seeking that the highest powers in the political realms would help to stop this they did not and that is going to be a part of the calendar um, I put up a post today and that is the subject of the calendar today excuse this I just want to start there a very hot topic I hate to flick. This is a part of the many months of Empress Menon, a series on the calendar dates extracted from the book Empress Menon, Queen of Sheba. All of the information I present is based around their Imperial Majesties of Ethiopia. And this information is an introspection it is also um, just really observing the dates and really recognizing and remembering certain need to be commemorated amongst I and I because they are so dear to their majesties the book can be found at Omega I search. This calendar is dealing with astrology, which Empress Menon, as an Ethiopian, uh, dealt with the astrology and used it as guidance, as I'm really recognizing throughout. Two dates um, repeatedly, things happen repetitively, and um, a lot can be really gathered from the introspection of how those dates correlate. So when I deal with the astrology, I'm looking at the principles, but I'm also looking at the Tawahito holy dates because their imperial majesties are Ethiopian Christians. They are following the Tawahito faith. And so they are also observing these very um, so Aries 
is the pioneering energy. It is also an energy of war. But characteristic of Aries. So the Taurus energy, which comes in around the 20th of April, is dealing with home, family, and finances. And we see how these vibes go throughout the calendar and the dates. The thing is, for this one, I'm going to just go straight through instead of giving such in-depth um, interpretations and spiritual interpretations. I also use the etymology because it is our way of overstanding the iridical revelation. And that's through the word sound power. Everything in this created language is telling us information. It's giving us definition and it's defining the word for us of what its essence really is. So this cross, this crux of their imperial majesty of, of eternity uh, was really just a gathering of dates and when I looked at it I said the all these dates are interconnected they intertwine with each other and what we'll see is that their imperial majesties are walking this cosmological journey uh, a journey of the zodiac a journey of what we know as myths and stories, biblical, but also those of different cultures, which share this common thread. And the common thread really being that of uh, the Christ or the energy of the Christos. And their majesties representing and being that Godhead, that Christos, something that we may not really define as Christians is that the Christos was a family. Christ, his mother and his father, that's a family. And he did his ministry with that family, even his apostles. And so with that energy, it is more than just the, a man that comes forward with the healing and with the eternal message. This is totally important for us going forward, coming up to a, a lot of centennials surrounding their imperial majesties, having passed several centennials already um, our future as not just Rastas but as Christians is very important in recognizing the walk of their majesties representing the Solomonic line and the continuance of Christ's family and then us as Rastas recognizing that Christ in his majesty and in Empress Menin, because some now told the Christ has a woman, Mary Magdalene. And so Empress is that companion. And she is not afraid to walk that walk of Christ and show us that in her walk, 1923, first making the journey to Jerusalem and then we'll see throughout the calendar how this energy of war in Aries and this pioneering energy is really what saves their imperial majesty and has them like really coming to the head of everything the, the, the ending with them coming forward in Taurus, which will be next month's calendar, May, in their salvation. 
So April is really showing us the battle. And then also showing the battle being conquered. Because what we see at the end of April is the ending of that first conflict that they come to um, head with internationally with Italy. And so let me go forward with the calendar. Now, as I was saying, there is a cosmology. And, and that cosmology is represented in a lot of fables and tales. And there is a beautiful uh, book called The Lights of Canopus. Now, in previous uh, videos, when I've done, I don't know if I've done it publicly because I have to keep track of that, of the, the calendars that I've shown. But the, this calendar is an ongoing process that you have to kind of know the prior months to even understand what is coming next. Because this is from the month of July. And War I Suhail. And that is the name of the Canopus constellation. This constellation has the name of Majesty's Son, Bozen. This constellation is connected to cannabis. And this constellation is connected to Empress Menon through her name, which also means marijuana. Empress Menon, ironically, is connected in this story through one of the stories, no, number 23. And we know the 23 in reference to His Majesty. We also see in this word sound, An War I Suhail, the name of Majesty, Hail. And we also hear in the etymology, An War I Suhail. So we can say that there's, are they saying they, somebody will war highly. So this may not have been any mystery in any way to Ethiopians at the time, being that the Zodiac and cosmology is originated from Ethiopia. So this Anwar Suhail, I mean Anwar I Suhail, this energy is a fate of many stories, all dealing with zoo types. So the story in book 23, this story tells us of two geese and it tells us of a tortoise and their family. And this is represented and we'll go into that. So, in connection to this whole vibration of this Christ energy that they are, is the Easter. Easter is celebrated in Ethiopia about a week or two after the American Easters. And so, like, this week is our Easter, I believe. And then on the 17th through the 24th, the Ethiopian Tawahedo Church is doing the week of passion. So their majesties are this battle for almost two years. Nevertheless, the battle becomes hot in April. We have his majesty field in Mechao. And then we have Her Majesty in the capital alone, of course, with generals. But she's also helping because Addis Ababa is getting terrorized. And so her hometown of Desi has already been bombed at this time. 
she's experiencing several different vibrations earlier even in 1928 and we will see how all of these battles that her majesty confronted even with exile is all connecting with how it all ended so with the energy of the etymology we have to look at this fable first read it get some understanding of how it connects it really just tells of an exile we'll go over that this and war i suhail is a war on the eye we say i as the self in rasta so in two ways it is a war on the self but then it goes deeper and it is a war actually on the eye itself this is no mystery to many who have to use these tools but we use them in our jobs or we use them as a part of our profession and we don't know what those implications are because we don't know the history their majesties being aware of that ancient that ancient cosmology and also not just their own cultural rearing and understanding this demon who has an ultimate goal they have also their position as the crystals to show us how to guide us through this battle against the eye now some of this information is coming forth from a series that I will be presenting as time goes on I'm always trying to stay in tune and make sure it's proper timing making sure I'm ready for it and most of the time I am not able to really be ready because it's iron it just has to be uh, prepared so in time I pray to show this series called signs of the time time being their imperial majesties of Ethiopia and the signs that they have had me to study um, because I am not so literate to be able to understand everything that they show me they give me a pathway to get some understanding and it inspires me to study. And what I find out is ex it's exactly what they wanted me to do to get to connecting with who they are so we can understand the forwardness of Christ. Because the Christ story that we have from the Bible, that's a 2,000 year old walk. That was a walk in a different time, and that was when Christ came at that time. Now, he has already come forward, and he's still not largely recognized as the Christ, Haile Selassie I. Even amongst those Rastas, it's very hard for them to connect with the crystals because of the damage that religions have done to them and to their minds to be able to connect with the, the Bible and the crystals in this way. And so the Bible tells is connected um, also to Her Majesty's calculated baptismal date, which is June 22nd, and 22, saying that the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. And of course we know of the word sound power of the far eye. And so their majesties represent the ancient eye of the Almighty. They say of Ra, they say of Isis, Osiris. Osor Aset and those balances of male Godhead and the male Godhead 
and that is the what their majesties are in our eyes as Rastas who view and follow his majesty's um, teachings and her majesty's teachings. And so this one Ja, even some will say and that is the representing of them as the Godhead. And so this is represented in the comedic as the eyes, the eyes of the body. And that the belief of what the eye represented is something that is not just a belief, but these are scientific facts. And which today we see on a whole nother level being used other than what it was known and used for at that time. In the ancient Kemetic, as I'm studying, the eye is the ak, and it is represented always in this circle or sphere, um, protected on both sides or flanked by the lions. Um, this energy is very important. We even see these lions, or we see one in Egypt today. So the, the eye is something their majesty showed us. They protect their eyes. They protect from the evil eye. Her imperial majesty was known to have sheets around her because she didn't want that evil vibration on her to affect her walk and her focus. And so even as an empress, it is like an order that you keep that sort of privacy and high vibration. And so she kept a certain purity in that manner. We also see that she guarded her eyes and so did his majesty in certain moments. The eye is very important and is called the portal, is the door. Very uh, significant purposes to your body and in connection to your body. And the eye of Osiris which is a scientific and, you know, it goes deep into the esoterics of how it is divided and what it is connected to. So this ancient knowledge of the eye has always been known. How, like I said, how it's been utilized through time is really what their majesties have been getting me to learn. This eye of the moon representing the energy of the feminine is her imperial majesty. And I have um, presented this information before because we can actually even see pictures of this actually coming forward to us in real time. a deep iritical vibe that connects with a real physical vibration. The foundation of the eye is something that is treasured at birth because this is the beginning of your spiral and this is your connection to the Most High. Now the eye Eve which comes forth from the word sound for Yahwa or Hawa, who is Eve, the first mother. And so this eye of the moon of Empress Menon, this, this eye is known in deep uh, Christian Kabbalah in the, the Hebrew tradition. It's not something that is not unknown how powerful the Shaddai is. Now, even you can even see the word I in this uh, old cryptic um, language of the, uh, I believe this is the Hebrew. And so this is supposed to mean the God, the creator. And even connecting it with the feminine 
energy of the Eve, of the first mother. And forth, coming forth from the eye is the tree of life. Because in your eye, which can be read and is a great science, can be seen your whole history. So, going, moving, moving forward, we have in our reggae music a lot of information on the eye. One, because we use it in our language, but there are some very deep esoteric the brethren give. This is from Akabeka, and he asks, who is Regulus, who is Canopus? question who's asking this question well we even know that Herod who was seeking the Christ child he was asking who is that star shining in the sky so bright find him and kill him and so this is an old practice of so of basic knowledge of astrology and calculations a science that we use to guide us through a birth chart at your time of birth was something that was naturally given so that your parents knew how to guide you in an ancient time but even today you can get your birth chart done and you can know more about how you are as an individual, but also where your path is going through where you came forward from, from under these. And the akar, the akar is another word sound, the ak or the I in the Egyptian. And this energy comes forward in different word sounds we have from the occult we get char we get crystals we get the curves we get the core we have the chakras and that encompasses so many different sciences and so many different realms of knowledge but it's all really speaking about a vehicle a person is a vehicle an eye is a vehicle. The orifices of your body, they're visited by little micros microscopic things. And some of us put things in those orifices as well. This is how life comes forward. And so the ancients, they kept up with this. And it was represented in, in various ways. It's all meaning the same thing. These are the same lions of the uh, Abuna Memphis Kedus. The same panthers are the same lion energy. This is all representing parts of the eye. This is the scarella. This is more of the iris. And this energy is known to us today as the Ouroboros. As you can see, this is a snake eating its tail. And I've done some energy on the Ouroboros with the um, the live here before. Uh, this is all coming forth from signs of the time. And this is energy that their majesties want us to become familiar with. Uh, simple uh, to, to know because we use it in our our Iyaric language in Rastafari. So it's easy to relate there. And even more so, it becomes important in this war against the eye is going on. This war during World War II uh, against the eye is a continual battle of good and evil. And the cosmology, the stories, when they talk about this energy of the eye, it is sometimes coded 
but sometimes I just say it straight out because the eye science is called irology. And so that science enables you to see different parts of the eye as we have in the ancient comedic, how the eye is being divided um, through the uh, science of the eye of Osiris. So we have known this and it is a mechanism of technology. You see it here being used. This is a World War II. Um, they, they say it may be that the Germans were making technologies uh, like spaceships to be able to today we see how that's possible. Well, they were using the same coordinates. This is actually the coordinates of their technologies. And this is the coordinates of the eye. This is also the coordinates of what we have today as camera lenses. And this is how the eye operates. So it's really nothing new. Technology comes forth from nature. But when a people do not know themselves and they don't know how powerful their body is, this becomes the easiest weapon against uh, unlearned people. And it has been for a very long time. Their majesties show us a great cosmology and this is through a portrait made for them for the coronation. Uh, I've given explanations prior on the energy here of Aldebaran that's even connecting with the Nazis and World War II and their purpose because they had a governmental purpose and an esoteric purpose. And their energies were like, they're going to build a spaceship to get to this star that is represented here. So if we understand and connect that, then we know that this story is way extensive. Because it is giving a cosmology and each and every one of these animals have something to do with the prophecy of time. Dealing with the crystals. Something that His Majesty wants us to become familiar with because if we come around and we're here, then we're, we're losing because we, we really need to know how to prepare for this, this ending of this circumference. And so their majesties are instructing me to give knowledge and to share on the eye and how this knowledge is old. It's nothing new and that it's being used and been being used against us. And many of us, of course, we have so many technologies connected with the eye that help us today. But there is a war against the eye. And this is something that was told way long time. A long time and several different cultures. This actually comes forth from, I believe it was a Hindu culture and then a Islamic um scholar actually translated that because see when it comes to science that religion was getting thrown out and the science was connecting and these fables they, they gave not just a tale of morality but also of and warnings many prophecies through this we actually see his majesty's walk and this is the story of the lights of canopus also known as on war i suhail in this tale which involves two geese which i etymologically overstand as the gays or like two Ethiopians, they're really giving us an understanding deeper um, when we use the etymology. 
Then we have the tortoise. And the tortoise is an ancient connection with what was known as like the foundation stone of the earth or that founding one, that Christ. In this is a story of, hey, be careful. It gives warnings. It also is telling of the time, even of the use of certain technologies as it explains it as polished mirror. Which in witchcraft, they say that is crying. And in technology, we call that surveillance. And so, this ancient tortoise story um, is one on its own to even understand what the energy of it is. But there's just so much involved in this tale, and I do go into that a bit in July's calendar more than here. I won't go too deep into the story. Except for I want to just highlight a part. Um, and it's not actually shown in this version of the book. It speaks of a fountain. And it calls it the waters of life. The waters of life or the spring of paradise. Or and the spring of paradise. That's showing us two connections in this energy of this water of paradise. It is called Salasa Bit. And so we see his majesty's name even in connection with the story, parts of the story, all of the parts of the story. It's an amazing tale that you have to read for yourself. Very short tale. Um, so we even see his majesty's name uh, interchangeably used as called Salasa Bill or Salsa Bill. And I think that's also a heavy connection because we know His Majesty visited Mexico. And that being Salsa, right? The word sounds are all in connection. They're all critical because they're telling us a story. Um, and they're even giving us a West Side connection in this um, Eastern correlation with his majesty. So, Salasa or Salasia, as it is in the French, is the energy of the Divine Mother. It is Salasabil in the Quran is a spring of water that has a fragrance and it it has like a cooling effect from its camphorine uh, energies. And this is some metaphysical uh, Islamic information about the Sophia uh, representing the great mother. And so we know that as Empress Menon. And are we not surprised that it is called Selassia? Who sees for Selassie? Who has the far eye? And so when we go into deeper into the cosmology, it, it's very easy to connect because their names are there. And even the meaning of their names, everything. That's, this is who they are. This word sound of an war i suhail is also something that manifested during the exile. His majesty was going through a court case with what we see here, the National Bank of Egypt and the cable and wireless company. And so we actually see him going through this legal suing or this matter of what we see legal matters, what we know the word sue. We know the word sue as a legal matter. He actually went through this. 
So we actually see His Majesty's life playing out with this word sound and the story itself. So nothing that I've ever learned in my Rastafari walk um, in houses, but I'm glad that we are connecting deeper um, nowadays with the astrology because it is telling us more about our Christ and um, giving us more of a personal connection to it when you read the fable, read the fable if you can. And I like what this eclectic uh, astrologer and a uh, well-known in the world of medicine, Periclesius, and he's talking about the eye as the microcosm and man as the macrocosm. And so he's telling us there is a you are a world within a world. You are portal upon portal. And we see that being represented in what they say is new age knowledge today as having several realms of the self, different bodies within the self, being one of the same person, but not really being able to know what that body really is, it's being affected no matter what, even if you're not aware of it. And uh, we know that as the chakras. He goes on to say, reflects the cosmos of the human body from the point of its birth and it registers all changes that have happened since. And we know this today as the science of irology. You can go and get your eye read. And they will tell you things about, um, you know, what you should do in your future because they're seeing what has happened to you from your past. They're seeing your, um, your scars and your bruises and where you need to clean yourself up. And that world is meant for healing. So this science of the eye is nothing new. And it is um, one that connects with astrology. It also is connecting in ancient times to medicine as it's connecting with alchemy. Now getting to the dates, having that into perspective that this journey of their majesties is one that is a journey and a zodiacal journey. And that is how we can also be able to, first of all, if we call ourselves Christians, see our Christ. See him walking. Because if we do not know the, the, the Jesus Christos, and then we know the Haile Selassie, these are born from women. This is an energy that is a natural energy that comes to us for our help. And whether anyone believes it or not, um, we still have such great sciences that are actually incorporating several layers of the crystals in their science. So it's a reality. Um, there is warnings within the uh, war on war I Suhail book twenty three, um, and. I will let you figure out. Now moving forward, Her Imperial Majesty during this month of April has been traveling to Jerusalem on her pilgrimage. This journey began in March uh, and it is ending in May. So throughout this whole month of April, she is in Palestine and Egypt in 1923. This journey I hope to commemorate in Israel, which is not, which was known as Palestine. I'm hoping to go there and commemorate her centennial because this journey is 
a center to this whole month of April and to the energies of their majesties several victories and battles and we can really cite how her majesty played a critical role not just when we say he's her consort he's she is his consort and it's more than that it's her walk and his walk intertwined into this powerful dynastic manifestation of the Christ. Now, all word, sound, and power is important. In 1928, their Imperial Majesties experience while they are um, have moved forward amongst the throne and they are now the prince and princess of Ethiopia, uh, Regent Crown Prince Rastafari is actually captured at Zalditu's palace and later here at the Betamadium Mausoleum built by Emperor Menelik and where his remains are. His Majesty being held up by the officers of Zalditu is heroically saved by Empress Menin, who has a tool, a tank. This tank came forth from the Duke of Abruzzi. He gave it as a gift. She uses it to make those who were imprisoning his majesty in this mausoleum to get him to be free um and i believe that this is in connection to the palace still researching because the story is that he was behind the palace walls and then later um i believe that the officers who hemmed him up were seized here and so we even see a lot of words sound as this mausoleum is on a Tege Menin road. Um, Empress Menin's energy through and through. This April coup d'etat um, by Zauditu's councils, it was nullified by Princess Menin. She came there with the tank and she freed his imperial majesty. Zauditu is really a relative of Empress Menin. And because they are Solomonic dynasty, they share these, this dynasty with the families of even his majesty. Zauditu passed away April 2nd, 1930 reigning as a queen of queens uh, through her inherited throne. She was going through grief and strife with the man who was her husband. And it was said that she passed away through this grief and strife. She passed away on the 2nd of April, 1930 and this is what allows their majesties to proceed and ascend the throne. Now, dates are so important in their majesty's walk because this is a zodiacal dance. And so we see that their majesties were able to ascend. This date is also in connection to the fact that we have on the 3rd of April, her Imperial Majesty's Earth flight. And so they are connecting her uncle, who is actually Zauditu's brother, and that is, um, this is Lija Yasu. She is also, what we will find out later, born in the vicinity of Her Imperial Majesty.
April 3rd, 1930, His Imperial Highness Negustafari is proclaimed Emperor of Abyssinia alongside Negust Menin, uh, Empress elect. And so on Her Majesty's birthday, they actually are proclaimed Emperor and Empress. This is before the actual coronation. And so we see that this is Her Majesty's birthday. This is also the date that Empress um, Zaltitu has passed away. We see a great interconnection. We also know that a part of the issue of the April 1928 coup. And this gives us a lesson something that we have to really analyze because the dates try to show us that hey we should look at this they're correlating because dates are very important until this day means that a date is very important celestially is connecting with that person and it is telling us their tale this is one of the first incidents of don't mess around with the king of kings and the queen of queens empress menon was a queen at the time negist and she is of the solomonic dynasty we know who they are and in this way, I hope that it was showing the Ethiopians who they were. Because that 1928 coup was very close to a near death for His Majesty. And I felt like, you know, judgment comes to us all. And sometimes we're shy to recognize it. But with this calendar it really makes you to look at it because the dates are all in connection. And so we see this coup ending in what is come forward in my eyes, ironically, which I'm no one to judge, but I look at the energies and the outcome of this math, and it doesn't seem like it was a good decision of Zauditu's. And so she ends up suffering um, throughout that time from health problems as well as uh, marital issues, premarital issues. And so we have to be very careful because as we are, um, we learn from their majesties, our ironically how to walk, respecting ones in their position and in their place is something that I take from this lesson. And we have April 3rd, 1930, His Majesty actually assuming his name as Haile Selassie I. And so this date of Her Majesty's birth, the ascension to the throne, also, His Majesty now known as Haile Selassie I on Empress Menon's Earth Life. This can't be avoided because the dates are telling us to pay attention. And I, that's why I love this calendar. Because it's making me to understand their majesties and how serious dates are. Um even connect with their majesties according to the energies of our own connective dates. This connects with me as an Aries because I'm born in the same month of her majesty so I can connect on some things but this higher level of energy is what we must pay attention to. So this is the 39th birthday of her it doesn't um 
always come to our mind to look at numbers and things, but I use numerology in this, and we do see even the 39 in there, 3. And when I see doubles or triples, I pay attention. And so, even this is an energy of 333, three, three, if I was to, you know, analyze and go a little deeper, as I sometimes do. So, moving forward, the 5th of April, as this becomes the time period of the crystals being celebrated, this is the feast of the Savior of the world, Madani Alem, as it's known in Ethiopia, the Savior of the world is Madani Alem. Now, this feast, I'm not sure if it's celebrated other times in April, but it being, um, I mean, in the year, but it being in April during the uh, Easter, I'm seeing this as a part of the weekly remembrances of the Christ. April 11, 1936, in the eve of their majesty, her majesty sends a letter written by Princess Sahai, who was very critical to her majesty during the war. She writes to Lady Gladstone of Britain, and she's writing to tell her, um, and I think she's a representative in South Africa for the Britain, uh, British Parliament or Council. And so she is sending out letters of distress to get this help from those who can help. And early, even before she did her speech, this is April, she is um, making a letter out to these officials to let them know what's going on in Ethiopia. Now, this is a date um, in April, and this is just a picture of Her Majesty in England as she is soon to move forward. Uh, this is the sum up of that exile she's going and returning to Ethiopia. Princess Sahai did several speeches in April and in connection with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She was, of course, fluent in several languages as she translated Her Majesty's speech for her. Um, her in German, French, and English. And so she would also go in Britain, throughout Britain, with His Majesty and speak before Her Majesty actually even made it forward to England. So she was really working hard. This girl was 17 as a princess. She's a girl. And she is, at that time, doing her most for her country and for Ethiopians, a home and abroad, as she speaks of this being a humanitarian effort, because she understands, as she speaks in her speeches, that if Ethiopia is stricken, that is the root of all humanity, and so that you are asking for that same a disaster to come upon you eventually no matter what because that is the law of nature you hit the root you're gonna feel it in the branches um, I go a little deeper and I won't go deeper into this um, in a uh, princess to high uh, energy is very special, very unique as an Ethiopian. And I was seeing a lot of correlations with an astrium called Tsehai Shi Ki. And it says her name in the astrium, but when you actually go into the cosmology, you start to see the connections of who this astrium is representing, what time it's representing, 
and a little even a little more prophecy so I didn't go into that not this evening um, what I'm finding is the astrology is this prophecy omen warning vibration uh, it's also deeply correlate, correlated with the Christ so it correlates with his majesty and that it has naturally formulated the history and that we can actually almost forecast this vibration by just overstanding the conditions that we're in and how that's reflected in the cosmology. It's real deep because some of the cosmology is just plain and simple. It's really just talking about technologies and things that are happening today. No different. Later, Her Majesty's speech to the women of the world, her second international speech, which Princess Sahai helped greatly with, is being put in newspapers throughout um, the, the uh, war. And because she's doing speeches in September, you might see speeches throughout the year, but it's usually just those two speeches. Um, and they're just being put out in any media format to get that attention. April 14, 1936 is the International Speech of Her Majesty. And as we read, as I read a bit of it today, it was broadcasted in New York. Uh, by some major companies uh, that we even know of today and several major companies and heads um, supported Her Majesty and promoted the speech. Now, it would even be the American women's organizations that would gather to make sure that it happened and making sure that aid was consistently coming through for the Empress. In 1936, the General Federation of the Women's Clubs in the United States, they send a formal response to Empress Menon through Princess Sahai, and they are proclaiming their support for Her Majesty. April becomes a big month because they're going to be going in the 1st of May. And so... While His Majesty is going to the battlefield and about to return at the last day of April, His Majesty is on the battlefield. Her Majesty is doing her best with the media and doing uh, the broadcast speech on the 14th. This is the 86th remembrance of that speech. So we're getting close to centennials. Nevertheless, we haven't even really been introduced to this speech itself. So we are, we are learning. Her Majesty's journey to Jerusalem is key to everything because Jerusalem is an international city. And so she was connecting um, iridically as well as uh, politically with those heads of the church. This is her in 1933. Her Majesty visited Jerusalem during the Holy Days. And so that is Easter and usually um, Moscow in September. The 14th of April, 1938, Her Majesty has gone forward while in exile. She's gone forward to Jerusalem again, putting up heavy prayers for the Ethiopians still on the battlefield. It's 1938. And she is um, blessed in receiving the foot wash blessing um, there in 1938. This is on the date of her anniversary of her speech in 1936. 
So she is telling us something heavy about this Easter um, energy and how she knows she is connecting with it. She makes her first journey in 1923. She, they're going through the battle um, for years, about two years in Ethiopia, the conflict. But in April, it becomes hot, and this is around Easter. So we see this Easter energy naturally forming through their walk um, as the Christ. So the 17th of April, 1936, this is actually uh, the British ambassadors who were deeply involved with assisting Ethiopia. Empress Menon's uh, close companion being the wife of Sidney Barton. Sir Lady Barton um, helped tremendously with the Ethiopian Women's Association, which Princess Sahai is a forerunner of as well as the Ethiopian Red Cross. So we have on the 17th date, Sir Sidney actually put in a request for more assistance for the princess and her works alongside Empress Menon as the patronage. Now this, they're very close with the royal family and this is during the time of uh, Ethiopia's distress. There, Easter is, as I keep up with the holy dates in correlation with the calendar, is on April 17th. And so, um, again, we see this uh, Christ energy and even in today's uh, calculations for Easter. Now His Majesty is on the battlefield at Mei Chow, and we see him in the famous pictures uh, shooting down airplanes with uh, artillery, uh, military <laughs> artillery, and we see um, him actually having some really victorious battles there at Mei Chow before he goes into exile with the Empress and here he is with the uh, this special German gun now this is all because we have to correlate his majesty in it to really get the fullness and to even get more of the revelation we see his majesty going forward Easter on a tour and he tours to the west side and this is truly a tremendous tour and many have uh, been able to analyze it but what I'm also seeing more and more of is that he is showing us uh, the West Side connection to this Christ cross, this cross. Empress Menon in the month of April, um, we're recognizing the fact that Empress Menon has a nursing school in Asmara, and she is personally giving out diplomas at this school for nurses at her hospital at Tege Menon in Asmara. So by the year 1954, she has established a nursing school. Menon is returning to Jerusalem time and time for the holy dates, but also commemorating special dates of things that she's, she's done her. April 14th, she's in, she's in Jerusalem. We have um, some documentation of in April, Her Majesty, right before her passing in 1961, she's actually making a visit to Jerusalem again, and she's getting help from a Dr. 
recall being um, a physician, a well-known physician in Jerusalem and also in connection with America. April is also the month of Princess Sahai's marriage to Lee was later, I believe, Ras Abeba, um, Abaya Abeba. And her life was uh, shortly lived after the marriage and also the life of her child. So what we actually see here, um, what I'm learning through uh, several of the dates is something very special and we will reveal more of that in August in connection to Princess Di. In 1942, when they marry, is April 26th. And so, um, this is about a year or so after they're returning from exile. And so, this is a very uh, good way to seal up the calendar with some more brighter moments. But also, seeing that their majesty's walk is bright. May just naturally um, we have Her Majesty returning from her foot wash uh, visit in 1938 to Bath and this is her home for the exile and so she is um, really renewed in this energy as we learn later from her word sound of her many plans and her futuristic uh, goals for Ethiopia. Now, April 29th is the birth of Empress Zauditu, Queen of Queens of Ethiopia. She's the daughter of Menelik and and what we know of as Queen uh, or Wazero Shiraga. And I love how the word sound is a part of our culture as Rastafari, the Shiraga. Um, it's a strong word sound. Uh, this royal family is in connection with Lijayasu, the uncle of Empress Menin. And Empress Zauditu is from the same prov providence as Empress Men, and she's from Wola. And we have some stories, which are narratives that are supposed to be uh, surrounding Empress Taitu raising Zauditu alongside Empress Menin, who is a little younger than the Empress Zauditu. Empress Zauditu transitioned um, at the age of 54. She was crowned at the age of 41 along with Imperial Majesty, as well as crowning Princess Menin as a queen of Ethiopia. So their connection is one that let me go forward. One that should not be, um, should be analyzed more because they are like sisters in a way. She is like a aunt, um, but they also are seen to go through a conflict during that time of uh, His Majesty as Ross. And so this deep interconnection them both being born in the um, passing of her around her birthday. We start to see that, you know, we are all interconnected. And in this way, we actually get to see how the family, how dates and zodiacs are intertwining. 
Now, so the month and the last days of April, uh, this is 1940 that Mussolini hung. This is the opposition to Ethiopia alongside uh, the Nazi Germany. And so on the very next day after 1930 being 1945 for Hitler, he ends up suiciding himself, as it is said. And this is in our eyes as spiritual people and as Rastas, no, no coincidence. These people who are the head of so much terror during World War II end up losing their lives at the end of our Ema's birth month um, and really sealing up that energy of that, that tyranny. And as a judgment to show the world of the Empress and the Emperor's energy and how that cosmic and spiritual energy can trump all of the technologies, the ideologies, because their majesties warned the world of this energy and what we see is also Europe later being terrorized by the same person they did business with and their cousins with their own family members and so we see this judgment and that is what we see in this month of April is the accumulation of the judgment, um, the aggression of the World War II tyrants, and then we see their ending in April. Years apart, and time did tell, but nevertheless, uh, back to back to show us that one-two order. So, on this very last day of April, we have here their majesty's action decision for exile. So we see this puzzle in April of the conflicts. And um, just to go further into the decision for exile, this was a decision made uh, through a council that his Majesty gathered after coming forward from Mei Chow, the battlefield, ragged from the battlefield, and going into council of what to do. Her Majesty is the one who makes the decision to exile. And His Majesty, as he says, he was reluctant. Um, he wanted to stay on the battlefield and fight. Her Majesty um, said to save Ethiopia, this would be the best decision to make. And as we see the outcome, and as we will analyze in May as Rastas, we already know of that victory of this, this journey. And this journey is the walk of Christ, one that we can actually see in this calendar of how these several conflicts uh, through spiritual means as their majesties are Tawahedo Christians and follow the faith to the T's. Their majesties have overcome tribal wars. They've overcome even being in the midst of the blitz in Europe during exile. And also seeing the end of the tyrants who started this tyranny or were faces of the tyranny. And so this month of April is a victory month, but it is also 
a, a month of, of great lessons of how this energy plays out and of just how we can understand more about the Christ and about the coming of the Christ and what he must deal with because as we get a more realization that this Christos energy is real and that it comes and comes again that we you know we will get a, a better understanding of how to be in order with their majesties in time and how to teach our children how to do so as well because if we don't show them that Rastafari is a future they will miss this chance and they will be the persecutors of the Christ. Because they will never have known that, oh, we were supposed to look through him coming through a woman. Because don't nobody talk like that. We say that, but we, we don't say it in the realization that we say that Christ and that he must come through a lady and the family or maybe not. Look how families are today. And then how will it be in the future if he's supposed to come later? If we haven't got him yet? Because as Christians, we waited for him. And the reality is that we're probably not, you know, the natural reality of the Christ is that he came through a woman. Not that he came from a sky. And I'm not trying to preach anything. I'm just being like realistic on the goal. Especially as a Rasta. Because the Christian... Uh, Faith has been formulated in its manner, and I'm not seeking to change any of that. And I'm not seeking to change anything in Rastafari, but to give us an understanding that we have access to now, more so than we did um, through my book, Queen of Sheba, Empress Men and Oswald, Queen of Sheba, and through her speeches, we get to know more of this Christ energy because that's what we believe and we know we see the Christ continuing and if we say that then we should actually try to see it continuing even more so and be in that belief so I hope this is not so so new because we are believers in this Christ energy but I hope that it makes us to think more on what is our responsibility as Rastas and Christians to his majesty and a lineage that is supposed to be continual. And um, their majesties would have us to continue to study and continue to grow. I know this is true because how they have me uh, in my life and I hope they have you the same way working very fervently for their kingdom's sake this is the, the kingdom of humanity um, that must survive this war that was not just against them but then because they are the root then it is against every uh, root race then it is against every man and woman of creation because it is the same enemy and it is very connected to the eye I wanted to introduce some things about the eye um, I didn't go deeper into uh, its connection as the science it is so I will do that um, and give more of a connection of what we call I chanting, I chanting being that science of the eye and how to control someone or to control populations or to control and manipulate people and enslave people. It's called enchantment. And so this is old science with uh, new technology. And their majesties would have always had us on it if we pay attention to their walk and we listen to their words so I'm giving thanks that I was able to come forward 
I wanted to do this methodically because this is new for me. And um, it is something that I believe that even ones will go further and further with. Uh, once they get an understanding of this, we have uh, His Majesty's calendar, which we need to take hold of and study and revise and all that good stuff. And we have Her Majesty's calendar, which needs the same. Needs to be revised, needs to be uh, analyzed, and um, make sure that we stay in time and on time. So I'm giving thanks that this is important, mostly not just because you need to be a good Christian, or that nothing like that, because His Majesty is actually warning us. And I'll come more with that, with signs of the time, because He's warning us of this ancient science and witchcraft in which we have become totally involved with some without consent um, but some willingly and it has begun to become a part of the judgment that their majesties um, have been warning about and that is something that I haven't had to come on here to do because my information is already being recorded as I do it with those who want to pay attention they actually know what it is and that's where their majesties have first had me to introduce it to and then who would be willing to listen to its fullness will get it and um know that this is something that has been foretold this is your book of revelation vibration and this is an ancient science and knowledge that we have to become more familiar with to be able to actually survive <laughs> we have to um, or else we can deny it and then the warning is in that book um in that book 23 of Anwar Suhail as well as many other mythologies that are in connection with their majesties that warn us of when you mess with this root you destroy the whole earth and yourself and we are actually seeing that of the repercussions of no one doing anything about Ethiopia well the gas that they took on is lightweight given to us every day sprayed on our foods um, we also get heavy, heavy salts from all of the air traffic we're being dehydrated more and more from the salts this is the same chemical but because it was allowed then in which Princess Sahai and, it, and Her Majesty warned, you let this go on now, you're going to be suffering from it. And, and Europe suffered that blitz. Bath suffered that blitz. And the rest of the world is suffering from allowing such tyranny to go on at that time. A warning, an eternal warning for us of keep the peace and the civilized manners for your salvation because there comes such a time that there is no backing out and you've gone beyond the borders and you've broken all the laws of creation. And so then we come to that point and there's no turning back and everyone has to suffer this is something that ancient knowledge knew of how important when the king of kings of creation comes to the earth this is nothing new and if you do not kiss the king and bless the prince then trouble does come 
And even with the world saying, oh, we bow and we love the seven, all the 72 said, oh, we love him and he is the one and oh, he, he is the biblical one. Even with that, they say, Lord, Lord, and yeah, it came on them. And that's something that we have to take heed of personally in our own lives, no matter what our politics are. Because we're going to have to really know that we're attaching ourselves to that energy that His Majesty is warning us of. And um, this is what their Majesties would have me to present this evening. They want us not to forget that African Americans have been at a consistent war racially and physically. And so to dismiss that and not to be able to see it in this war that Ethiopia ensued in 1936 being the same thing now, which I, I said that in an interview earlier when I was doing this work, so it was my own personal experience with this. And especially with trying to come forward with their majesty at a time like this, I wouldn't even know. But what it was, was that as I'm going through what she was going through, the war and really feeling it and experiencing it, she was help, she's helping me through each step of the way because she's saying, follow me, follow and do what I did. But what did I do if you don't know me? Study me. Study the culture. Know the path. And they've given me insight personally. I've told you about the eye situation. Then to learn about how important the eye is. I never expected to know that this is an ancient practice of prayer. I didn't know that this is an ancient sacrifice. For higher spiritual vibrations. I followed what they told me to do. What I it was inspired by them how they show me signs how your creator connects with you and so please be attentive in this hour um, of what their majesties is they're bringing forward through just simple means simple means because this is, no matter what I say or do, this is something that is recorded on bigger levels than I would actually even be invited to, right? So, in that way, we have to understand where we're at in creation. So that we can actually maneuver through and, and survive this and... To see us go on without total annihilation. Which Ethiopia did, yes, did incur. This is a real thing. Because the war is silent does not mean it's not going on. I've experienced this for almost five years. You're also, no matter what, you're going through a light war. You're going through a sound war. Because that's how people are making money. But you don't have to just incur it. You can learn of ways how to block it. And how to defend yourself in it. Her Majesty gave uh, gas masks out. All I can say is keep your health up. Make sure you keep your air as purified as you can. Use your fires, use your healing methods, use your stones, energize your life because you're going through that same battle of Ethiopia, you know, no matter what, because the fact is that that momentum wasn't stopped. It was allowed to go on, which she warned of. And because that momentum has grown into organization after organization against what is right and just, 
we're coming to a time. And, and, you know, who am I to say? I just know what their majesties is revealing. And I'm just giving it as it's given. Only time will tell. Not me. So I'm giving thanks. Um, I say this even in an hour of very unknown situations with myself. I've come on several times and I've had issues with coming on with certain energies in the city blocking me and they do a certain pattern. This is their way, something I've had to get used to. It's not easy. It's a war. You live it and you live it willingly without saying anything. Willingly. But with me, it is almost to my detriment if I don't say something. That's what their majesties are showing me. Because the information that I'm translating of their majesties, these are connected to uh, the Vatican. And they're connected to uh, many heads that don't want to have that connection with them. It also reveals something very heavy and deep about the Kabbalistic energies that fight. I say Kabbalistic, not like Kabbalist, but Kabbal, meaning a gathering of evil that goes against righteousness. And that has had the same agenda. It has not changed. Get that golden eyeball. Get that highest connection you can get to the most high. Get all of them. That's been the, the destiny of the, what's the judgment of what's going to happen to the energy that has been utilizing the sciences and the energies to go against the root of creation. And we're coming to a point to where, yeah, where are our prophets? Where are our seers? Where are our people who used to be able to give a message in, or and people that listened even? Well, that's becoming far and few. And, but that doesn't mean that the energy is not still there. Messages come. They come personally, and they come in a wider realm as well. <clears throat> and that this responsibility comes with my life and my child's life in danger, my husband's life in danger. And this is a daily thing. Thank God I'm here. Thank the Most High, Highly Selassie, the First Empress Menin, that I'm surviving this. Because my life is in danger every day with the works that I do. With what they have me studying and they they make me on it, brothers and sisters. They make me on it daily. Now this, now that, now connect this, now do you see that? Put it on there, put, it, put the notes up, put this note up. Because you're going to connect this later. And all of this has come from some time of studying and overstanding and walking in obedience. And so with that, I know that there is no failure, no matter what someone else's decision is to do. So I pray for your protection and for your family because you're at war. You're at war ironically, whether your country, your state, or your city is at a, at a, in a battle or not. But the, who has the battle always been against? People of my skin complexion, the root people of the earth, you know, the first peoples, those peoples. So we are struggling to survive a great battle against what is humanity. And I, just like Empress Menon, as I follow her, I can't allow all of this to go on around me, which is just a perpetual system of, of, of terrorism, really. Sound terror, as well as um, light terror. And this is just something that we've gotten used to because it's society. 
it's still a war. More we become more conscious and aware of the war that we're at, we will survive it. So I'm giving thanks. And blessed evening, highly I, Salah, the first Empress Men and I.